It was the moment we had feared coming for some weeks, but a 0-0 draw away at Luton, followed by a 2-2 draw at home to Swansea, meant there would be no playoff party, no Premier League dreaming, and no purple turtle mayhem for this year's Reading FC side. Welcome to a slightly despondent, I guess, episode 262 of the Tyler Stem podcast with your host, Mark Mayer. The podcast by Reading fans, for Reading fans, and joining me this week, the view from the Dolan is Ben Thomas. How are you feeling, mate? Yeah, I feel a bit better than um, than I thought I would actually. I think it's, you know it's been coming for a few weeks, so it's um, yeah, the realization that the season's over with two games to go. Um, yeah, you know, I I felt worse later on in the, or early on in the season anyway. So yeah, not not too bad today, Mark. I guess at the very least, this doesn't come as a surprise. Anyone who's watched Reading for the last 10 or 12 weeks will have known that, you know, as I said, this is the moment we feared coming. It's not as if it's laid on us at the last minute with a a, a kind of Leo Ajoa esque last kick of the ball while, while Reading fans are streaming onto the pitch thinking that they've got sixth place when in reality they're seventh. That would be a totally different scenario and utterly embarrassing were that to have ever happened to our club. So at the very least, we're, uh, we're not feeling that. So let's go on to the recap then. Talk about those two games, the Luton and the Swansea draw. Before we do that, a quick thank you as always to our sponsors, ZCZ Film and our Patreon subscribers helping us along in these dark and desperate seventh place moments. So let's talk about it then in the recap. Come rain or shine, it's time to relive the latest match action with the recap. This podcast is sponsored by ZCZ Films, Reading's oldest ultras. The Luton game then, Ben, it was, oh, it was just, I must say that emotionally, this was the final game for me for this season. Emotionally, I, I, you know, I sat down, paid my tenor for the eye follow and just said, this is my last hurrah. This is the last chance to, to have the anxiety, the nervousness and, and potentially the excitement. And, you know, if it all comes off good, then, you know, we keep on going. But if it doesn't work, then I, you know, I, I did feel like I was checking out of the season if we didn't beat Luton and obviously with Barnsley winning as well on the same day. And what, what we got was a, a one shot on target, frustrating performance. And it really... Um, May tempted not to say that it summed our season up, but it certainly felt as if, you know, it, it was the theme that we felt for the last 11 or so weeks of this Reading side. Starting a bit poorly, having a good second half, but ultimately just no penetration and coming away with a result that just wasn't good enough for a playoff team. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that game was just a joke, really. Um, I think I said in the column, the only positive thing about it was the trance tunes before kickoff, really. Um, it, it was it was very poor all around. And I think <clears throat> to get to a point where you're you're waiting until, you know, injury time to get a shot on target in a game of that, that magnitude was um, was ridiculous, really. And, you know, we've we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks about the collective responsibility and, and obviously Palmer's talked about that as well. But for me, as a fan in that moment, there was absolutely no one on that pitch that seemed even remotely aware that they needed to win the game. Um, and that was the most frustrating thing about it. I think Luton, to their credit, were, were quite good. They looked quite bright going forward, but you know their season has, has long been over. And so they were just kind of playing out the game and it, it felt at times like they were more interested than we were in, in getting three points. So I think I agree with you. I, I think at that point I was like, well, <laughs> incredibly, we've still got an outside chance to to get something into the playoffs heading into the Swansea game. But it was a very poor performance, really, and, and very disappointing. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it, it it was very difficult to watch at times and and, and very lethargic. And, and it, it, it did really, as you said, sum up the last couple of weeks as as, as kind of the club and, and as, as a fan going through those highs and lows. But I think certainly that game took the emotional toll on me, as I'm sure it did many others listening to this. So it was a difficult result to take, but it, it was what it was. Um and no amount of positivity from from Panovic after the game could have convinced me otherwise that was anything more than a than a shocking performance, really. No, and this is the thing is, is you mentioned Panovic, he he will listen to him a bit in, in a bit, and he did sound genuinely um not taken aback, but genuinely despondent after the Swansea game. And obviously, you know, if anyone has to believe, he is the one who has to believe, and that's fair enough. But he him talking after the Cardiff and the Luton game did kind of give me a feeling of a man who was trying to convince himself as much as anyone else that this season was still alive. And that's the thing for the Luton game that I found perhaps most frustrating is that the players who the onus was on to produce the winning goal 
were the ones who turned up the least of all. I felt like Lauren and Minamoto had a good game. And, you know, the defence did bits to stop Lewin. Lewin had a couple of chances they did take. Raphael made a bit of a flappy save that worked out. But um, it just felt to me like the the players who were most stable in that game were the defensive players. And that we go to the Swansea game, I think that the quite clearly the best player on the pitch, actually, for the Luton Reading game is John Swift when he came off the bench. And it was no surprise to see Swansea, uh, the Swansea game him start. Again, you just realise the fluidity of his playing midfield is so important. Why we can't quite get out of that out of Elise is probably an experienced thing. Ajaria just, I don't know. Okay, let's just take a little brief pause here for Ajaria, Ben, because Beluco came on against Luka and he came on against Cardiff and he looked pretty decent, um, lively and all that sort of stuff. What would it have ever taken him for, for him to have started against Swansea? Because once again, we persisted with Ajaria on the left wing. And I just, I, I can't understand what he has done to maintain his position in the team. While we've actually got someone who's coming off the bench week in, week out and doing more than he's done in the 80 minutes previously. Yeah, I mean, going back even further with, with Aluka, I've always been, um, I suppose, in the minority, because I've always been quite a big fan of him. You know, the, the one thing that Aluka doesn't lack is effort. Now, I'm not saying that Ajaria... Um, you know, doesn't put the effort in or doesn't put a shift in because he does. But the the, the problem with, you know, not just Ajara, but for a lot of those players in that team is that in recent weeks, there's been no end product. So in the same breath that we're talking about Ajara and his end product, we could talk about Elise as well, who obviously was dropped yesterday and rightly so. I, 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 I kind of feel like really the, the kind of, the, the playing Ajara is more down to contract situation because obviously we know that Aluka won't stay. So yeah. I suppose in Panovic's eyes or, you know, in his mind, he's like, well, what's the point of playing him? And I, I feel like, <clears throat> you know, with 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 Aluki being there, he is, he's always given as much as he can give. He's never sulked. He's never thrown his toys out of prime. He's never gone on social media and complained. And he's been, you know, I don't like the phrase, but a model professional. Now, people listen to this might say, well, he's on, you know, 20 plus grand a week. It's not really the point, though. You know, we've seen in previous years when players haven't played that all hell was broken loose. And he has just got on with his job. And I, I feel very sorry for him, really, because he should have he should have been given a chance with a lot of other managers. He should have maybe <clears throat> been more in the fold. I don't think shipping him off to China really helped anyone because we were still paying his wages there. So, it, it you know, it, it that kind of situation really has summed up the season and we've talked time and again about lack of, of, of quality and depth really and, and I think w- with Ajaria he, he probably should have been taken out of the team you know two, three games ago just to give him that breathing space but with someone who's not going to be here next season and you, there's no resale value what's the point of playing them? Um, and that, that's been a symptom not just for this year but for previous years as well you know you think back to the last game of, of last season which was what late July and how horrific that Swansea performance was. You know, there was players on that pitch that were never, ever going to stay at the club. So why should they bother, really? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it, it summed up a very bizarre season. Um, it summed up a very bizarre situation that Panovic has kind of found himself in in recent weeks. And it summed up the fact that, really, we have very little um, strength and depth to, to call on when, when players are struggling and, and need a break. Yeah, which is best summed up, I think, by the stat that Reading have only used 25 players this season in the Championship, which is the lowest in the division. Um, and it kind of made me think of, you know, that 11-12 season when Reading won the Championship. Perhaps you can obviously say, oh yeah, Jason Roberts came in and that was the big January signing. But we signed Hayden Mullins, who played five or six really important games. We signed Ben, ben Kofobi, um, on loan as well, who came on for, you know, he just ate up 20 minutes when players, if he wouldn't have come on, then players might have been too tired the next game, might have picked up an injury. These sort of things, you just need little little bits here and there from your squad players. And you can say Panovic has got young players that he could have done that with. And I would certainly say that, as a, you know, Aluko would have been a good option to do that sort of thing more with, but he doesn't feel like he can do that. And yeah, Ajari is a good player, but I just think that, as you said with Elise, when when they are doing the same thing week week in, week out, and not producing that end product, then it just feels difficult to me to keep on with it. Funny enough, for the Swansea game, we looked pretty comfortable. Got into the lead, good goal from Yakimete. Um, 
Jao and Rinomot are kind of missed chances. What what caused Reading's collapse then? Swansea getting two goals pretty quickly to turn it round, then hit the post as well, so should have basically won the game. But what was behind Reading's sort of slip from being in a good position? Honestly, I think it's down to fatigue, Mark. I really do. I, you know, that, that stat is, is incredible. You know, 25 players used is... You know, for a team that has basically been fighting at the top end of the championship all season to use 25 players, you know, the the amount of energy that these players, um, you know, spend in terms of chasing balls and and, um, tracking people and and all the things that they do, I just can't believe that that we've managed to get through... um, you know, just using using the minimum amount of players, it's incredible. And and going back to Rajar and Elise, if you, there's probably some incredible stat that someone can can throw out. But I would be really interested to know how many times they've been fouled this year and targeted by opposition players because they are the ones that that we'd look to get on the ball and kind of move it forward. But you know, they they surely have taken more hits than they needed to um, from from opposing players to to just try and get the ball off them. But I I think you know the Swansea game. You know, it really was was down to to fatigue, lack of concentration. Um, I, you know, I saw some bizarre things on on Twitter about Raphael making a clanger. I mean, it was a good save initially to get down that low for for who is you know someone who's what six foot something, and there was no one else around there. Now, had the players been on the ball a bit more, you know, the defensive players that would have been cleared and, and off we go. They weren't, and obviously low pounced and, and does what he does best. I mean, he's a great player. Um, it was highly likely that they were going to get some goals yesterday anyway. And then obviously with with the with the final goal, I mean, he had more time than probably anyone has recently in, in any box. I mean, it was ridiculous. And that, again, is just down to lack of concentration, not tracking runners. So I, I really do feel like it's been down to fatigue and this, you know, we call it a collapse, but this kind of drop off in, in performances has really been down to fatigue. Um, I don't think Lucas Jow has played as many games ever in his career in a season. He looked absolutely exhausted. Um, you know, you could talk about Elise there. Lauren has obviously got away with with very little criticism from Redden fans, but he's not been great the past few games either because he's played pretty much every game this season. So there, there's a lot of tired legs in that team and there is a lot of, of need to kind of regroup and, and see where we go next year. Um, and that is why... Me personally, I can't be overly critical on 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 the club for for what they've been able to achieve in a relatively short space of time this season. Well, I was just um, as you were talking, Andy. You don't ask and you don't get. I've got the stats for the most fouled players in the division, and um, Reading have three of the top ten most fouled players this year in the championship for total number of fouls. So Elise and Ajari have both been fouled ninety two times. Um, that's the sixth or joint sixth. Um, number of times being fouled and Andy, Andy Renata actually 84 times being fouled as well who's 10th in the league so you're absolutely right you, you've got players that have been kicked mercilessly for a lot of the year and um, and both of all, all of those players played over 3,000 minutes win Motto 3,500 minutes which is the um, third most out of those 10 players just as a, as a bit of a comparison but I think you know, when you talk about criticalness of the team and everything, I, I'm i just drawn to the realisation in my mind that if we'd have swapped this season round and we'd have started with this sort of dodgy, dodgiest bout of form and ended on seven wins in a row or seven wins out of eight, sorry, we'd have thought this is a brilliant team who's going to go on to great things next season. Now, obviously, momentum into next season doesn't exist as it would in that scenario in reality. But it does just show, doesn't it? It's how, how you finish and it's the hope that kills you and all that sort of stuff um, comes around quite a lot. And uh, there was one moment actually in the Swansea game when we were one nil up and Sky Sports put their little um, as it stands table in the bottom corner and suddenly we were only five points away from Swansea. And I was like, hang on a second, there's a chance <laughs> that I didn't see yeah. us take it. So those sort of things, I think those are the things that are the most galling, aren't they? And at that point, I just started Googling Swansea's um, final fixtures. So, hold on, could we catch them now? You know, obviously, Barnes <laughs> are there. But I was like, well, if, if Swansea is the only one left, what can we do? And, you know, they, 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 they did what they did last season and have managed to secure a playoff spot in Berkshire. So, it, it it's, yeah, I mean, it is galling and, and it, it has been, as I said, an up and down season. And, and it is, as we've always said with, with Reading, it is the hope that kills you. And I think based on their 
their performances in, in recent games, they've done well to keep it going up until the last two games, really. Um, I think there's, there's been some huge success stories, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not too despondent at this stage about how our season's gone. And I can understand people saying, oh, you know, we've bottled it and it's been a collapse and things like that. But, you know, without sounding boring, you've got to look at the bigger picture. And there is literally no Reading fan in the country or anywhere else that would have said that we would have been competing at the top part of this division this season. Absolutely no one. Um, and if if you were one of those people that thought, yeah, we'd do all right and, and we would be competing, you know, then you're going to be disappointed because you feel like you should have got there. But I just can't, I can't see how anyone can um, label this season as a, as a disappointment and as a failure because, you know, we were never, ever going to sustain that form because we wouldn't, you know, we're not good enough. We we haven't got the players to back that up. Like you said, we haven't got players that can come on and do 15, 20 minutes of high quality work towards the end of the game. We just don't have it. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's a difficult time for Reading fans and there's a lot of split opinion in the fan base. But I think when people sort of go away and have a summer, they'll realise that actually this was a good season and, and we've performed well, really. Well, let's um, end the week up then. There's one last point I want to make, but a couple stats to throw at you. Um, ironically, we're actually on the best home unbeaten run um, since August 2017, which was the period in which we made the playoffs. Um, six games we're unbeaten at home now, so that's the best run of the season. Um, I think there's four draws in that, though. Uh, but we are actually winless in 15 games versus Swansea, so maybe we shouldn't have expected anything because, um, again, that's probably going to include a playoff um, defeat in there as well. Um, the last point I'm going to make about this game, then, Contrast this game with the Bournemouth home game. And the reason that you can do that is because both Swansea and Bournemouth, when they came to us, were top sides, or our top sides. Both were actually on really bad form when they came to us and were there for the taking. And it shows how much we've slipped, as we've talked about, that the Bournemouth game, we blew out the blocks, took our chances, three great goals, games done, game is done at half time. Swansea game, we get a goal, can't build on it. Did you know? Didn't play badly at all, but just couldn't get it over and couldn't take that chance and couldn't get it over the line. And I suppose those two performances, if you want to compare and contrast how Reading have slipped from the middle of the season to the end of the season, I think that's a pretty good comparison for it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd go back even further. I mean, there's four games that stand out for me this season. Um, first one is obviously Blackburn away early part of the season when Blackburn were a really good run and you know they were top scorers at that point and. Armstrong was doing really well and we just absolutely savaged them. You know, there was literally no club that could have lived with us in that game. We were just superb from, from start to finish, really. Um, Bristol City at home, where Bristol won a good good run of form as well. And again, had a, had a fantastic result against them. Cardiff away, um, where, you know, suppose at that point they were, they were, they were a good side and, and we just made them look ridiculous. And obviously, you know, the Bournemouth at home game, which... Is probably my favourite of, of of all because of the the quality and and you know I can't generally can't remember a game where we were three 0 up you know in a game of that magnitude. Um, so you know we've had some some great results this season, some great performances. The problem is is that you know probably from Bournemouth uh, at home it kind of all all deteriorated from there really. I know that um, Don Goodman, the you know the Sky Sports guy, said that it was Preston, and he's got a point. You know there was. There was an element of that missed penalty, maybe that 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 probably put the, the the kind of the demons into our heads a little bit. But for me, I think it's probably probably the Bournemouth game was was the height of what we reached this season. Um, so yeah, it, th- there are lots of good memories. But you know, you think about Wickham away and you think about Birmingham away, and you, that's that's six points, and that would have got us in the playoffs. Um, so. Yeah, we can look at missed chances, but we also need to kind of really celebrate how well this team has done with those games that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, we'll, we'll obviously be doing a season review at the end of the year where we'll have a bit more of an in-depth look back over the season. But just one game for me that I think in terms of turnaround and what went from, from good to bad, I think that Wickham game did a, a lasting psychological effect on the team. And certainly Lucas Shaw, if we win that game, it's very different. You mentioned Birmingham a game where we went just as they got a new manager. So if they'd have sacked Aitor Karanka a week later, we might have been in the playoffs right now. But there, that is the that is football. They play the cards you dealt. So let's hear from um, Roger Panovic now. As I said, a bit despondent as he spoke to the club after the game. 
um, and after that we'll be going into the mailbag. We have to look at the at the things that we we have to improve and um, and implement in the future as uh, as one of our uh, another element of our identity. But again, uh, very proud, very proud. I didn't know actually what to say to the players because again, I didn't prepare for this. But very proud of um, of their effort and very thankful also for for everything we've been through, all the setbacks, all the injuries, and being capable of recovering several times some of uh, the players, not only recovering their health and well, well-being, but also their form and their performance. Uh, it's, been, it's been great. It's been great to see the guys uh, coming back and uh, playing as a team and you know, looking for, for each other. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a great, again, more positives you add to this, you, you feel uh, more disappointed because uh, today I think we, we had a good game, but we didn't. I, I, I just you know, feel it's, um, it's a difficult moment. For all the latest Reading news, analysis and opinion, visit the website at thetilehurstend.com. So, Alan Scott getting us underway then, emailing in the Tilehurst End at gmail.com, the best place uh, to send in your mailbag questions. He says, strip back the potential positive consequences of the new manager effect from this season. And what are we left with when you examine the last two thirds of this season in respect to Paolo's performance? It feels he's made little progress with such an expensive and talented squad at his disposal. Quist- critically, when the pressure has came, we have flopped. Did this expose Paolo's shortcomings as a manager? Now, I suppose there's two answers to this question, and it's probably you know a really boring way of saying it's somewhere in between. But in between, we but we have seen, as I talked about with the Luca and the substitutes we've spoken about in the last few weeks, and doing the same thing over and over again, and in the last few weeks, and expecting it to produce better results than it has done. That is a flaw on Paunovic's system, I think. We have, you know, we have, we've attacked a lot of games and come away with some poor results and the manager bears the brunt of that, I think. But I think it's a pretty heavy but as we've spoken about earlier on the podcast, we don't have a big squad. The young players, you would have to assume that if he thought they were going to be properly championship ready, he would have played them more often. Um, and really... I think, as Alan says, you know, the the new manager effect of him coming in, I feel like there was a lot of performances in the t- last two thirds of the season where he has done particularly well, where he has the, p- produced some pretty good tactical setups that have got some good points. And ultimately, um, while he's not devoid of criticism for the, the post-mortem, as it were, he's probably not going to take the biggest slice of blame for me in terms of, you know, why we didn't make the playoffs. No, I mean Alan's raised some really good points, and it you know, it, this is this is a view that is widely held. I think at the moment you're either in the give him some time, give him a summer, and see what he can do, or get rid of him now. Camp. I don't think there's any middle ground really. Um, and and you know what what Alan's saying there is true. We have we've dropped off, and the confidence has dropped, and the tactical decisions haven't been great. From from my point of view, I I just feel like it's not his team. So. <clears throat> Panovic, not Allen's, by the way. But, you know, from, from my point of view, he's come in two weeks before the start of the season. He's probably had maybe a week because of the COVID restrictions to actually work with the team. Um, he had a weak squad to start with, a small a small squad, probably one of the smallest in the division. He was able to bring in three loanees who, to be honest, you know, when when we do the kind of the, the season review, they're pretty average. Um, they, they don't get near the, the, the first 11 in terms of starting at the moment unless there's injuries. I know rest of us came on and scored a great goal yesterday, but he, he won't stay beyond this season. Um, you know, Gibson um, has not been great, really, to be honest. You know, defensively quite flawed in, in a lot of respects. So, you know, there's there's a lot of players there that really you'd think, well, OK, Samido, if we were going up, you'd probably keep him. Otherwise, not a lot of point. Um, we've had major injuries, so that's not necessarily his fault or his, his, his kind of staff's fault. That's a historical conditioning issue that has been rife in, in, in the club for, you know, two, three seasons. Um, you know, and, the, and the, the facts are really that, that 
as it stands with two games left with one nineteen games, which is the second highest since the 13-14 season. Um, we've lost 13 games, which is the lowest, along with 16-17 and 13-14 and seasons. The highest league position will be wherever we finish since 16-17. And we've conceded the least amount of goals since um, 11-12. So when you, when you look at those statistics and you think, well, OK, the football at times has not been good the last couple of weeks. But actually, when you strip it back to, to bare stats, he's done all right with a team that he didn't assemble, with a squad that he didn't pick, with players that are incredibly young and, you know, dare I say it, quite naive in these situations, with very little experience and leadership in the team. And he still managed to carve out probably a seventh place finish. Now, on paper, I think that's pretty successful. As you said before, if we flipped the season around, yeah, of course. But he wouldn't still be the manager. If we'd, if we'd started the season that we'd had over the last eight, nine games, you can guarantee Paunovic wouldn't be here. So it, it's very, very difficult. And it's a very difficult season to review for those reasons because it has been such a, a tremendously um, <clears throat> you know, exciting, brilliant start kind of middle bit was a bit sticky and, and obviously completely tailed off recently so it, it's very very difficult to analyze it from a, a collective point of view but actually when you strip it back to those bare statistics and those individual games I, I really do feel that we've we've done okay um and I think for, for that reason alone he deserves another shot to be able to go right this is my summer this is my preseason. this is what I want to try and do try is the key word because we all know the financial pressures that we're under so I think I think we need to give him a little bit of a break and go okay well look let's let's just see what happens now you know we're not I don't think we'll be battling relegation next year I think there are going to be worse teams in the league than us I think we will probably be sort of mid-table I don't think we'll be pushing it as high as we have done unless there's some major improvement in the in the strength and depth which at the moment no Reading fan sees because of the uh, the financial implications at the club. So that's my kind of long, long answer to that, Alan, if that's all right. I hope that, hopefully that makes sense to you. No, I know what you mean. That's a, It's a very good way of putting it, is that if, um, you know, we, we have all, all of these things in comparison to last season. I think the problem is, is for myself and a lot of other Reading fans, of perhaps of, of my age and older, is that we see Reading as the team that won the championship in 06 stayed up, the team that won the championship in 12, that got to the playoff final in 17. You know, these are over a pretty short space of time have had some really amazing achievements. But if you narrow it down to the last three or four years, um, there haven't been any achievements. So it's it's very difficult. It depends where you're coming from as to how big Reading really are, perhaps. But, you know, one way you're, you're saying about Panovic coming in very late. Can, he's finished higher than Middlesbrough, who have had probably about the same sort of level squad that we have, maybe a bit more, or in terms of talent and a manager who's been there for longer. QPR have had their manager a bit longer, more settled squad, finished above them. We're going to finish above Millwall, same again. Stoke, Preston, Blackburn, much more stability in all these teams, much more, and certainly, you know, not too far behind us in terms of quality, if behind us at all. And we have finished above them. So that's the championship. And if you... I think if you take that as a big positive compared to where we have been previously, then that's, um, you know, that's caused to see it as a good season. Um, the other part of the Poundovic question, Sean Rich 96 tweeted us as well, said, if Dai decides the only way around FFP is to go balls out on investment, um, that's his quote, by the way, uh, promotion or bust, just kind of Wolves Villa have done that before. Um, has Poundovic deserved that chance to do that or do we seek a more credible appointment? And this is the other part of the, the Pound or in or out debate. That's, it's not quite really there as a debate yet, but the, the question I would always say to anyone who kind of doubts having Poundovic in charge is who do you get instead? <laughs> We've done it time and time again where you kind of sack a manager then kind of look around and think, oh, well, you know, what, what is there? It's not in the forest have got Chris Hewitt in. I know he's a favourite of people saying, oh, yeah, he's a good manager who can get teams up. Well, they're finished 17th. So that's not a good argument anymore. I just feel that the fundamental fact is if you sack Poundovich, you have to find someone else and there just isn't anyone else. Well, I think, it's uh, again, that's a really interesting question because um, we said this this time last year in terms of not, I keep saying that, obviously we're still playing, but you know what I mean, at the end of last season, where it's like, it's got to be promotional bust and let's throw money in it. There was no money that came in. So, as I said, three loanees. And that was pretty much it. Um, 
you know, I think I think the way Panovic has played those players has made them more valuable. So there's more resale value in the players than there was this time at the end of last season. Um, it, it depends if you if you want to sell your soul really, and you go for someone like Nigel Pearson, where you go right, just get us you know automatic promotion. Here's all the money you want. Crack on with it. I, we don't. I don't. I don't feel like I know enough about Dai Young to to really. Um, kind of answer that really and I don't mean that from a kind of a flippant point of view but as fans we know very little about him as an owner um he doesn't talk to us he doesn't really communicate with us um from what we understand he's very rarely in the country and this is not me criticizing him this is just kind of the basics you know with John Medeski he knew very clearly the kind of manager and the kind of people that he wanted in and around the club that was then obviously slightly distorted by by Zingarevich and then obviously we had Clement and Goulet and all those other chaps in. So it, it it's become a bit blurred over the course of the last sort of five, six seasons as to what direction the club wants to go in. Again, I don't want to come across like I'm pro Pauno because I support the club, but I feel like he, based on those stats that I kind of rolled off, I feel like he deserves the opportunity to be given a bit of money and go, okay, what are you going to do with it? Um, you know, I, I said when, when Bowen was sacked that we should have kept him. I, I, my view hasn't changed. I feel like Bowen probably would have done a similar thing to to what Panovic has done. So I'm not I'm not viewing him as as kind of the golden goose and he's the be all and end all. But I just feel that if people have done a good job, they deserve a crack at, at trying to move it forward. And I think the least the owners could do is give him some time to create what he wants to do with that team, whatever that looks like, and just just go from there. Now whether or not they say it's just loans and that's it let him go and pick the loans that he wants. If he wants to go and spend money or he's able to spend money, let him go and spend the money. You know, I would imagine we'll recoup some, some money a little bit this, this summer from the players that, that are gone. Um, but, you know, you, you, we don't know, you know, we can be given figures, but we don't really know what that means for the owners and, and what they're prepared to stamp up and how much they're prepared to gamble, really. And of course, as we know in this division, it is a massive gamble. Well, that's a good chance to be in Sean Birch's question, who says it's probably quite likely that Elise will be sold. And whilst we should all want him to stay, it's understandable from a business point of view. What's the minimum amount you'd be happy with us selling him for? For me, anything less than £20 million is a disgrace. And this, there's two parts to this question for me. Is firstly, how good do you think Michael Elise is actually going to be? We, I think we can all agree that his potential is very high, but... If you were to pick a player in the Premier League right now that you can see his career mimicking, who would that be? And for me, that links into how much you're going to get for him. So I think that if someone offered £10 million for him and Reading accepted that, I wouldn't be angry about that. But Forget the release clause reports, because we don't know if that's true or not. But in a straight-up negotiation with one year left on his contract, the amount that he's produced this season and the years before, I think £10 million can get you, you know... £7 million for the bank to make sure that we don't go bust or FFP or whatever. And then hopefully, you know, £3 million to be that in a loan, a good loan signing, maybe a, a, a sort of League One attacking midfielder who can come up and, and we can raise the game of and that sort of stuff. I think that's a reasonable enough scenario, given all that we know and how the world is and everything like that. I think expecting £20 million is a little bit of... It, it would it would be more money than QPR got for Ebuechi as a who is a better player. So I don't think we'll get 20. And Ben, I don't know who you would say for this, but if I was to say the sort of player that I think Elise would ultimately become in the years ahead, I would say Nathan Redmond, someone who's going to get between like six to eight goals in the Premier League, six to eight assists, you know, have a good season, may get 10 or 12. But I don't. he's not going to be a Jack Grealish. He's not going to be a Phil Foden. Um, and therefore that has to calculate into what you think you're going to get for him. Well, I think in terms of comparison to players, I mean, I think, yeah, Redmond's probably not a bad shout. I, it depends. I know it's, a, it's an obvious statement. I think it depends where he, where he ends up. I kind of, I get what Sean's saying about, about getting 20 million for him. And I think had, had he probably had a better run up to Christmas, we probably could have cashed in a room in January if people were going to, were going to stump up the cash really. I think I think he's gone anyway. I don't, he's not staying. He's not going to sign a new contract with us, which is probably what the club will try and do. So I, I would imagine that they will probably start looking for suitors for him. Now, one or two things will happen. Someone will either come in and go 15 million done and that's it. Or, you know, because it's a buyer's market, there will be clubs like Wolves, 
probably Crystal Palace because they love a bargain. Um, maybe Southampton. They'll low ball and they'll probably start at something like, you know, eight or nine and then work it up and there'll be a bit of a bidding war between sort of three or four clubs and then it's down to who pays the most. Um, <clears throat> I think whatever happens, he's gone regardless. I, I, you know, t- I think really that the, the board have got to get as as much money as they possibly can for him, knowing that it's going to be a good five six years before they're in a position where they've got anywhere near as, as someone as valuable as Elise to sell. Um, controversial opinion: I, I don't think Elise is as good as everyone makes out. Um, I think he's really struggled these last few games. I, I think he's a great player. He's clearly very popular in the dressing room, but I, I don't think he's going to be hugely missed. Now. He's not going to be hugely missed if we manage to keep Swift. If we don't keep Swift and we don't keep Belize, which we won't, we're in trouble because there's no one else to play that position. So we're going to have to buy. And the problem is with us is that because our financial situation is so public, clubs are basically just going to take the mick with with what they're trying to buy. Yeah. On top of that, once we get a fee in for those players, the clubs are then going to go, right, we're going to add an extra one or two million to the players you're after as a club because we know you've got the money. So it, either way, it's going to be a very difficult summer and it's going to require someone very, very astute in the uh, football business world to be able to guide us through it. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to be difficult. And I think I think 10 million would, would be great for us. Anything more than that is a real uh, bonus. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. We need someone who is going to be... Nicky Hammond desk in someone who can get five million pounds for Matt Mills in 2011 is the sort of nous that we're going to need, and that is difficult. Kevin Bryan said, if you could sell, if you had to sell one, who would it be out of Swift, Zhao, and Elise? And I suppose we probably have just kind of leaned towards Elise there purely because of the you know, the capital that you can get for him. Obviously, if it's 30 million for Swift or 10 million for Elise, it's no, it's a no-brainer, but the one who's going to generate the most cash out of that is Elise. The one who actually, out of those three players, who you'd say, here's a game, who would you most rely on over the course of the last season? The Elise is probably the last play you'd rely on. What I, I, I know what you mean when you say Elise is not as good as everyone makes out. I think he it's potential. It's obviously homegrown and everything like that, and he is a very good player. But a lot of what people are hanging their hopes on for Elise is potential. Now, if we, whatever reason, keep Elise next season he would have to score 15 goals and make as many assists because that's the trajectory that he has to follow for him to be worth keeping hold of if we weren't going to sell him for £10 million. Now, do we think that's going to happen? I don't know. I mean, out of those three players, would you say that there is anyone that you would most want to, most be comfortable leaving? Well, I mean, I mean that's a really specific set that he's gone for in terms of, of moving on. Um I think, as I said, I think Elise has gone regardless. I think any anything over seven or eight million, and and yeah, he, he's he's gone with Jao. I mean, that's going to be an interesting one. If, if a club comes up and says, right, it's four million, five million, I think the club will probably take that. Um, I think I think Panovic knows that out of those three, Swift is by far the most important player out of all of them, um, because of what he can bring and, and his kind of. Um, you know his control on the ball and the way that he can dictate games. Now, obviously, he's not. Had, we've not had a full season out of Swift, so I think that might just get him through the summer with us. I think. I think clubs might be a little bit more dubious of spending money on him. I hope with Jao, I would. I would like him to stay. Of course, I would because we need goal scorers in the team. That said, I think if 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 there's a, is a good enough offer that the board can accept, I think he'll go too. Um, and that then leads on to a whole host of, of potential situations where there could be any player up for grabs at that point. So I think it's really important that the club identify who they desperately you know, want to make money out of and then who they kind of think, well, if we get a good offer, they can go. And then players that they absolutely categorically need to stay. In that bracket, I'd put Rinomota, um, I'd put Loren, um, you know, I'd put Yid on at the moment because we haven't got anyone else to go. Obviously, Morrison and McIntyre are, 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 are kind of, in in theory, up for grabs. But again, you know, I don't see any clubs steaming in and going, here's loads of money for them in terms of wages. So it, it, I think it's going to be a really interesting summer. And we, we've said for the last two, three seasons, our summer's really important. But this really is a big one because we, we desperately need some money through the door to avoid any sort of points deduction. Yeah, well, Andy Taylor says how much of this squad will still be here come the first game in August. I think that's... Um, 
such a that that could take us a long time to go through that. So I think I'm just going to leave that one for now and say. I mean, he says that Richard Zaluka and Bulldog are going. I think it's so difficult to predict how many others are going and what ties that into is Philip Norris saying, do you think we'll get a points deduction this summer? Ben Stevenson saying with FFP and the points deduction in place, I mean, I'm not sure there is a points deduction in place as well, but um, would you be happy to sell the likes of Raphael Jao Puskas, um, the main boys on a high wage and play the likes of Southwood, sign a League One striker for next season instead? Now, points deduction wise, I think there's going to be a lot of politics going to be at play here because... FFP or Profit and Sustainability, as it's known in the Championship, is not just going to be near Reading. It's going to be a lot of clubs that, because of the pandemic, fundamentally, are going to be wavering around those lines. And therefore, if it comes to be that there's seven or eight clubs that are going to be hit with points deductions, I don't think that it's politically viable to do that in the midst of a pandemic of all that we know. And just FYI the accounts that we've just had for the season, I think it's 1920, the accounts for this season for everyone are going to be absolutely terrible because there was no fans at any point, really. So I don't think that um, the point deduction is particularly viable. If it happens, you know, I'll accept I'm wrong and that maybe they are going to just point deduct half the league and that's what they want to do. But I think what's much more likely, Ben, is that we'll be under some sort of transfer embargo like we've been under before, that was the kind of soft embargo where the um, Football League had to green light our signings. If that is the case, Reading are probably going to end up selling early. At least say, I mean, Ben there, he says, you're going to be happy to sell Puskas. Yes, I'll put him in a wheelbarrow and walk him there myself. Um, it's honestly... Oh, that's harsh on George. I love George. I think um, he's great. He's, he, he's someone, if someone offered three million quid for him, I would absolutely waved goodbye because yeah I think I think he's up for grabs I think that you know honestly Mark I, I do I think this season that, or this, this pre-season I think they're all up for grabs I think that the yeah, point yeah. that um, whoever I can't really say it you just mentioned it but Raphael for Southwood yeah Southwood's out of contract for God's sake give him another contract you know even if you give him one year because if someone comes in two million for Raphael yeah I'm again I'm not against Raphael but it's money through the door and we can replace these players with players that we know have got a bit of hunger, a bit of heart. Southwood is, is so highly rated by so many in the game. You know, when he had the loan spell up in Scotland, they absolutely loved him. So well, and also we've got, we've got Southwood and then we've got Conya Boyce Clark as well, who's a, yeah. probably a bit green to be having in the championship squad at the moment. But if that's the scenario we have to have, then, you know, I think so be it in a way. But what I mean about Buscas and those sort of players is that they are absolutely not worth, you know, you don't want to, sell him for nothing but I just feel like him in particular is the sort of player who's going to have resale value particularly to foreign clubs you know as the first choice Romanian striker and that sort of stuff he's the sort of one that I think the club are going to have to say if we do encounter you know a transfer embargo or something like that he is the sort of player that I think the club are just going to have to say this is the you know these are the guys that we're going to sell you said earlier about the club need to know who is potential obviously you know high marker for players they don't want to sell but who is up for grabs I really do think that he should be one of them because fundamentally he's not done enough for me and the other you know, one sorry to interrupt but the other one we haven't mentioned is Liam Moore you know if if, if an offer of two three million comes in I think he's gone as well because that you know he he's not he's not been great the last couple of games I don't know if it's because of the you know the, the kind of the, the fatigue element or maybe the social media um you know that 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 kind of you know, appalling incident is playing on his mind, but he's he's been touted for a long time to be leaving and it's never come to to pass. So I honestly think with him, you know, if, if we if we can keep McIntyre, uh, Morrison, and obviously we've got Holmes as well and then bring someone else in potential loan, that's four centre-backs that we've got there and we've survived with less than that. So I, I really feel like if, if a bid comes in for more, I think he's gone as well. Yeah, po- points deduction then, that was the point kind of... Not, uh the crux of the question are you you know out of 10 how much are you fearing a points deduction this summer uh I, I think you're right i think you're spot on about all the other clubs they're gonna they're gonna massively set a president if they go to to us right that's 12 points deduction or 10 points or whatever they want to give us um although they're normally multiples of three aren't they so yeah, i think i just don't see it i just think they're going to give us grace and i think you know the, the main thing to Reading fans is if you can afford it and you can get to the stadium, just go out and buy the brand new shirt and that'll sort us out because, you know, <laughs> all the money through the door at the moment is is going to be really important for the merchandising and everything. So, but it, it, 
I, I, I don't I don't see us getting a points deduction. I think maybe an embargo, but we can still do something with lone players there. But I honestly feel like they're gonna they're gonna have a go, go through a process of a couple of weeks where they just get rid of players and then start again and go. Well, how much money have we got to give over to the accounts and into the bank? How much can we reinvest in the squad? And I think that's going to be key first. Um, what I don't want to see us doing is kind of stockpiling players and, and bringing players in and then trying to shift players after that. I'd rather see players go and then go right. Well, what what have we actually got to do now? What do we need? What's the priority? And then just go from there. Yeah, it could be a very long, uh, well, a very quiet and then a very long transfer market in terms of incomings, which probably is right. Actually, one of the things, um, very minor points to just tag on to this, I think the Kasumo sponsorship is up this summer and then it's actually our 150th anniversary season next season. So the, don't be surprised if the club don't have a sponsor on their shirt next season is all I'm saying about that because it might well tie, as you say, buying a new shirt might just make it a bit more appealing to fans if they do a an old school no sponsor and, and try and make the money back in terms of fans buying the shirts. Don't um, uh, Maybe that is where we'll end up. Um, final question then. Of the mailbag, Paul Hawkins saying, why are Reading so poor at recruitment? Let's compare Brentford signing of assets and selling them on, paying less wages, bills, slash agent fees and having more success. Do we need a director of football? The club needs to survive also by selling players on for huge profit. We seem incapable. Well, I, I would agree with all of that um, as a quick answer. The Brentford model, it, 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 it's so. I think it's easy in football to look at clubs doing it well and say, why aren't we doing it well? Obviously, there's, you know, you can only, uh, only so many clubs can do it in the same way. And Brentford have a bit of a niche. They kind of go to the, the Scandinavian region, pick up players there. They have a B team. They don't have an academy at all. So, you know, it works for them and that's their thing. It's obviously, you know, it's not viable for Reading to completely copy that. But... It is possible to have a good recruitment set up in the championship, Reading, just <laughs> for whatever reason. I think partly is the sheer refusal to sell any player, slash the Ron Gourlay massive contracts, slash the general poor performance of the team. It, it, it just all mounts together, doesn't it? It just all combines to create the situation. Yeah, I think I think he's fine. I think historically, and when we say historically, you know, Going back sort of eight, nine years, that's been the case. There's been no real direction. There's been no real model for the players that that we want uh, to bring in and, and to grow. Um, I think, you know, the, the Brentford one is a good one to look at. But for every Brentford, there's a Nottingham Forest who have got about 85 players on their books. So, you know, we, we are not, we're not as bad off as other clubs, but then there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think, I think we just need now clear direction I think these players that, that have kind of been on the bench all season from 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 the academy and from the under twenty threes, I think they need to to really be given, um, you know, given the confidence to to kick on and, and improve and 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 be part of the team. Um, we know it can happen. The club is very proud of of their academy graduates, but we just need that clear direction and say this is the model that we're going for. And you know, Reading fans will get behind it because that's what they do. They want to see fire. They want to see passion. They want to see players giving it their absolute all and 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 part of the reason that you know the relationship has soured between the fans and the club is is because of the poor recruitment not only that but the ridiculous contracts that were handed out that's not the players fault you know if someone's offering to pay you 20 grand a week to be a utility player you're going to take it so you know I, I those days are gone now really with with Bulldog and, and Aluku moving on and and other players as well so yeah, I think I think he's absolutely spot on with what he said there. But I I really do feel like there is a change coming, and and with the director of football comment, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think directors of football really are kind of a, a vital anymore. I know we've got like a footballing board that includes Michael Gilks, which is probably not a bad thing, but someone really needs to be taking charge of these these decisions and saying what what do we want as the model for this club? Forget this season, forget next season. What are we going to look like in you know three, four, five years time? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's move on into News Bites then and uh, discuss what's been going on around the club in the past few days. Send in your views to the at gmail.com and have your say in the mailbag. I suppose this links in with the mailbag because anyone who wants to send us a um, you know a question or a thought for next week's show, please do that via the email, the tilehurstend at gmail.com. Alternatively, send, you can send us direct messages on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, or just you know tweet us generally. Um, there won't be 
pretty, I'm pretty certain that we're going ahead now as joining in what is turned into a huge social media boycott across English football from the Premier League down to the Women's Super League and the Football League, as well as the FSA, the Fans Federation, the LMA, loads of organisations like that, loads of supporters groups getting involved. Um, a huge uh, three day from 3pm on Friday up until the end of Bank Holiday Monday, a social media boycott of all platforms as a show of solidarity against the platforms that uh, we consider to not be doing enough to end online hate and online abuse, particularly racist abuse, which continually continues to be uh, all too prevalent in football and in society. So we are looking like we'll be joining that. We're just, you know, it's certainly as a, as a what we consider ourselves to be a pokey Reading podcast. It feels perhaps a little bit uh, big for our boots to be kind of making these gestures, but I think ultimately the solidarity of it is uh, is kind of p- persuading us to join in. And that means obviously, you know, just for the side point of the mailbag, do send it in directly to us. But Reading are going to be joining it. Um, I think certainly a lot of Reading um, pages and everything will be joining it as well. And and Ben, this is a, you know, it, it's good to see the club being being part of these things at the forefront. And obviously what we saw with the awful incident with Liam more recently, it's uh, it certainly couldn't come. Um, it's certainly not too soon. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't you can't criticise anything or, or fault anything that is um, is actively trying to tackle racism. Um, I, 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 you know, there's no other option at the moment. Um, <laughs> sounds very old school, but if people can't behave, you take it away from them. And, and that's that's exactly it, really. Um it's it's just beyond disappointing now. It's just disgusting that this keeps happening. So, yeah, top marks to to everyone involved, and um, you hope that it will have you know a positive impact, and and people will really start to think about their actions and and the way that they they post things on social media. No, hundred percent. So yeah, as a, as I said, the club and a lot of other um, club people being involved in that. Let's talk about what's gone on around the club as well this week. Not a pretty disappointing last few weeks for the women's team. No wins in seven now. Lost 3-2 to Spurs in the FA Cup. Then a 1-1 draw with Birmingham in the Super League. So they're seventh in the league. Winning four four games out of 20 this year. It's a weirdly, weirdly, uh, weird league, the Super League. Um, certainly a bit of a two-tier league with inside it. And Red and Sandy slipping into the, the, the lower tier of that. Also a bidding... Farewell to Far Williams, um, who is retiring from football as well. Been a real stalwart for England over the years and, and seeing out the last few years of her career with Reading. Uh, we've been very happy to sponsor her this year as well. And also we had him on the show a few years ago. So really um, top player, um, top person. And congratulations on a, on a great career, Far. If you're listening and uh, any Reading fans obviously do send on your... Your congratulations to her for a very good career in the game. She's uh, put that up on Twitter. Um, under 23s, they lost 2-1 to Sunderland today. The under 18s had a 5-2 defeat to Brighton and a 5-1 defeat to Fulham. So not really and not not a great picture around the club at the moment. They're 11th in the Premier League at the moment. The under 18s, they got Southampton, who were bottom on Tuesday. Reading play on Saturday at 3pm, May the 1st. Let's talk about that now in Big Match Preview. Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise. Come on, you Oz! Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor, ZCZ Films, showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop. Keep an eye out for Norwich away. As I say, 3pm it is on Saturday. Um, I, we were talking about this before. I follow, I'm pretty sure it's an option, but I think Sky Sports at this moment in time haven't announced what game they're going to do on Saturday so that may maybe by the time you're listening to this they will have it might be on TV because if Norwich win in the championship um, they need a win to guarantee it or to better Watford's result um, or if, I think it's if Watford don't win then that pretty much guarantees it as well so yeah pretty big game for Norwich sadly not a big one for Reading and I suppose the question is Ben do, do we do anything different do we shunt the loanies out of the squad or shunt the players out of the squad who are out of contract at the end of the season and throw more kids in? Do we at least take this game a bit more seriously before doing that against Huddersfield? Um, I, I would not like to see us go and get a whopped 7-0 by playing loads of kids against the best team in the league. No, I don't think you'll do that. I, I was really encouraged actually by, um, I know it was very despondent and, and you know, disappointed with the, with the Swansea result and, you know, the the fizzle out of the season really but you know one of the things that's, that stuck out or sticks out for me is the fact that they said we've still got responsibility to the fans and to the club and I think 
it's very easy to say that, but I, I really hope he sticks by that because, you know, we, we've still got to get, play a game of football. Norwich will, <laughs> probably will win. Anytime a team needs anything, they play us and they get it. So, you know, they'll, they'll get the win and they'll be, they'll be champions and, and congratulations to Norwich because you've had a great season. But what I would say is that there is literally no point in putting Bulldog and Aluku in the squad um, because they, they're gone as much as I like those players for their work ethic and their professionalism, as I said earlier, there's no point in having them there. You know, let's just see what else other players can do if they come on the, off the bench and, and, and go from there, really. In terms of team selection, I think you'll probably want to play some of those players that have been injured. So, you know, if if Swift is 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 fit enough, um, which he you know should be to to start the game, then see if we can increase his minutes heading into preseason. Um, same with Jao. I'd probably stick Elise back in just to mix it up again. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you you'd like to see a few more younger players come in. Maybe stick Tetek in for for. Reno or, or Loren to give them a bit of a break but you know other than that there's, there's very little option that he's got really um, you could argue that he could play someone like Neves coming through but would he want to would he want to chuck you know a, a young striker in, into the mix against the, the best team in the division probably not it's probably not a good game to, to ground him in um, you know maybe Huddersfield the, the last game of the season might be a better game for that so I think the, the team selection will be intriguing in terms of what who he values there and who he wants to push through. Um, but I, I mean, I don't see anything hugely different in, in what's going to happen in that game, really. No, um, it, it's actually some stats to throw at you for this one. Um, the last time a, a clean sheet was kept in this game was 2012 when we were in the Premier League. So it's the last, you know, eight or nine meetings have been festooned with goals. There's always been a, there's a hell of a lot of two ones in there. Um, as it was earlier in the season. Reading haven't beaten Norwich since 2016. That is six games without a win against them. Um, yeah, it, it is just one of those games that Reading are going to have to... It, it would be quite ironic, I suppose, that is one aspect of it, if Reading do go and produce an amazing performance. I suppose we can't rule out the the idea that the pressure has been getting on this squad and that now that is unleashed they can go and um, go and play a great game of football. I suppose that is one element to it that perhaps would be a bit of a sods law factor for Reading. But yeah, we, we've we've given Norwich some good games over the last few years. As I say, the 2-1 defeat early season wasn't particularly bad. 2-2 um, we drew there in uh, April 2019 with that Rinomota late goal. So certainly no reason for Reading fans to think we are going to go there and automatically get tonked 3-0. In terms of predictions, um, the league, to update you on that, as it gets very hot with the last couple of games left, nobody picked a draw versus Luton. Um, Handbags and Ollie picked a draw versus Swansea. I had a 1-2 Swansea win, so I was very close to reclaiming top spot with that one. But uh, Westy is currently top with 27. Handbags, 26. Myself and Ollie, 25. And Sim is on 20. Um, ben, well, prediction-wise, what are you going to say for Norwich? Uh, I will predict that if Reading fans have got to pay for the game on IFLA, very few will. That would be my prediction. Um, <laughs> Score-wise, I mean, I, I'm just going to go 2-1 Norwich. Um, I, I just think that they're going to want to win the title and they're going to want to do it quickly and they don't want to eke it out to the last um, you know, last game of the season. So I think the, the, the emphasis more is going to be on, on them. I, I get what you're saying about the pressure being off Reading, but... I don't think they've really played like a team under pressure. I think that's been the problem, I think, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so I I don't see any massive change in our in our performance or tempo. So yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go two one Norwich, I think. Yeah, nervous energy has been in short supply. Nervous um yeah, nervous despondency has maybe been the thing, the thing that Reading have had a lot recently. I'm gonna go three one Norwich. Um I think, yeah, I think ultimately this is a game but Reading, yeah. There's goals in this fixture normally. Norwich aren't the, the world's best team defensively and Reading aren't the world's worst team offensively. So I think we'll score. But yeah, I think Norwich will have too much and there's a quite a high chance of a, of a late satisfying ceiling goal for them to guarantee the title. And they'll, they'll run off merrily into the night and, and Reading will be left to contemplate another year in the championship, as I'm sure we've been doing for the last well, last couple of weeks in reality. So that draws an end to this episode of the Tilehurst M podcast. Ben, as ever, a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark. You take care and uh, have a good week, everybody. Absolutely. And we'll be back after that Norwich game then for the penultimate show 
of Reading season. It feels like it's been a bit of a roller coaster, but one of those roller coasters where you're all waiting for the big dip at the end and it just kind of glides effortlessly back into the tracks and you have to get off the roller coaster and ask, is that it? Well, sadly, playoff hopes have been dashed, but Norwich away, it's a, it's a chance to go and have the last laugh. Come on, you Arsenal.